Welcome to We Drink and We Farm Things. This is the farm comedy podcast that is an adult happy hour for the farming community. We drink adult beverages, talk about the ups and downs of farming things, and give zero fucks about not having the perfect farm life. We keep it real with you and share the mistakes we've made and what we've learned so you can feel less alone in this farm thing. We drink things, we farm things, we drink and farm things. Oh, hey there, Sam. Oh, hey there, Bev. What you drinking? I just opened a can of unicorn farts. (laughs) The can is fabulous. Isn't it? It's from Dewclaw Brewing, but hold on, hold on. This wasn't even the best part. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this uh, on the video YouTubers, but this beer has glitter in it (gasps) what yeah so hold on pouring it out pouring it out (laughs) let's see oh my gosh it does look shimmery Mm -hmm. it it's very subtle glitter so it's not like overly obnoxious but it's sparkly. My beer is sparkly and it makes me happy. So does it make your pee sparkly? <laughs> no, it does not. I had one on Saturday and it didn't make my pee sparkly. So I've got that going for me. <laughs> Could you imagine if it did? I feel like that's a good like selling point. I think that that would be a marketing yeah. tactic yes. for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So what did you open over there? So I opened a Blake's hard cider, caramel apple. Mm. It's really delicious. And, uh, it's part of, you can buy it on its own or you can buy it in a a variety pack too. Um, they're promoting their variety pack. It's called a bushel, um, because it's a bunch of different ciders. So that's (laughs) one of them. And it's really good. And it makes my basic bee heart just so happy because it's tastes like fall. I love it. I was looking for fall flavored beers and I haven't been able to find any yet. So unicorn farts. It was, I mean, that (laughs) is all seasons acceptable. (laughs) (laughs) Our drink peep. This episode is our friend Kayla Wood. And she is at Honey Creek Homestead over on the Instagram. So cheers, lady. Cheers. So we're going to chat about our Henny and Rue September boxes before we get into this week's episode. So Bev, what was your favorite thing in this month's box? All right. Uh, You didn't even really have to ask me, I'm sure. My favorite thing was obviously the scarf because I have so many scarves. And when my kids found out that I had more than five scarves, they were like, what, what, what would you do with more than five scarves? And I was like, kids, I've got like 40. (laughs) Yes. Same. They're not all chicken, but now I think I at least have a couple of chicken ones. uh, Yeah. I'm pretty sure I have four or five chicken ones and they're probably all from Henny and Rue. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. I actually have it right here next to me. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see the pattern here. It is super cute. Yes. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous. I didn't think to grab the box and bring it in here with me next month. Next month. Yes. <laughs> next month we will plan, but I was just looking through the box before we recorded and I was like, Oh, I should bring it in here. Cause it is super cute. And this one's a little more neutral because the main color on it's white. Yeah. So I feel like I could wear it with more things and not like scream chicken lady, Mm -hmm. just like whisper chicken lady. (laughs) Yeah. I have a rainbow chicken scarf that is like screaming chicken lady. (laughs) Oh, that sounds fabulous though. It is. I, I just, I love chicken scarf. So I'm really excited for scarf weather. It's coming soon. I say that as it's like 88 degrees today, I'm in a tank top, but Hmm. Now, it is 66 here now we had a storm roll through and it like dropped down to 60 oh. it was nasty uh so yes I'm wearing a hoodie right now but yeah, I saw that I go do chores <laughs> later I'm sure I'll it'll be warmer outside <laughs> so what was your favorite thing in the box so since I won't steal the scarf thing um uh, I would say the hen print brew buddy Ooh. which I didn't grab um 
but it's basically like a koozie type yeah. thing. Yeah. But it like fits on big cups, like 32 yes. ounce cups, which is awesome. Cause if you live in the Midwest, um, everything sweats, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> even your beverages. <laughs> like this is even sweaty a little bit already. Yeah, mine is too because it's so humid right now today. It's it's hot and humid. So, hmm. yes. So can't be mad about that kind of human gift in this box because it's mm-hmm. handy. We also got a bag of the Flock Party Shrimp Delish because chickens love shrimps. It's true. Yes. And we also got three carabiners, which most people will be like, why would you be excited about that? But this might be my second favorite thing because yeah. as it says on the card here, you can use it for hanging waters or feeders and securing enclosures. We use carabiners to secure our gates. We use carabiners to hang water, especially for chicks. If you have the overhead hanging water and you want to get your younger chickens used to it, but maybe they can't reach where your default setting is for that kind of thing. You can use a couple of carabiners to give yourself some length there. So those are just handy to have on the farm. Yeah. I use them for everything. Carabiners and those, um, what are those called? They're like bungee cords with the hooks oh, on the end. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that that's not the technical term for them, but I use those for everything and ratchet straps. Yes. Those are the three yes. things that I always have on hand, ratchet straps, bungee cords, and carabiners. I can do all things with those three things on hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We also got a bag of dried spearmint, um, which is really awesome because it helps uh, keep like creepy crawlies away because it repels them. Like none of the bugs tend to like mint. Um, And also it kind of like freshens things up. So you can like sprinkle it in your coop, sprinkle it in your nesting boxes and your chickens can eat it too. It's totally safe for that. Yes. And we also got Ropa poultry supplement which is another fun kind of herby gift. It's got, um, it's an oregano oil, which provides antifungal, antiviral and antibacterial benefits. Yes. I love oregano for the chickens. Mm-hmm. I need to grow more of it. I actually planted three new oregano plants this year. That way I could chop Ooh. off more and just throw it in there and let them go to town. Yes. <laughs> love it. And we got uh, a copy of the Chicken Whisper magazine, which always has some articles and stuff in it for you to peruse. Mm -hmm. And we got some faux eggs. And I'll tell you, when I opened the box and saw these, I thought they were real. (laughs) Like there's little like speckles on one of them. And it looks so realistic that it fooled me. So I would hope it would fool a chicken, but I don't know, maybe chicken's a little smarter than me. But they look really legit. Can I tell you a story really quick? Yes. We had um, our neighbors uh, farm sitting for us while we went on vacation and we got Mm -hmm. home. I looked in the egg skelter and it was filled with all of the wooden (laughs) eggs. Oh, no. Oh. I had forgotten to tell them that there were fake eggs in it, <laughs> but oh. it wasn't all of the wooden eggs that were in the skelter. So they had put some of the wooden eggs inside the cartons that they had taken home oh. for their own eggs. <laughs> so it was like, Hey, you have some of our wooden eggs. I got, I'm going to bring you real eggs and I'll swap them out for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was very awesome. <laughs> you should have just not said anything you and just- then waited. Well, (laughs) these are the same friends that I sent home a dozen eggs for them for Christmas morning to make French toast. And I accidentally sent them a dozen hard boiled eggs. (laughs) (laughs) So you you were such a prankster. (laughs) So on Christmas morning, she calls me and she's like, Hey, I'm so sorry. I know it's like seven o'clock on Christmas morning, but I just started cracking eggs and they're all hard boiled. Can I please come by and get real eggs? I was like, yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's too good. And every box comes with a nesting box liner. It's the liner in the bottom of the box. It's compostable. So you can just slide it in there, let your chickens lay their eggs on it, and then throw them in the compost pile when you're done. So it's eco-friendly packaging. Yes. And then in October, we do have a bit of a sneak peek. There's a super cute garden flag that says happy Halloween. And it has a chicken silhouette within a pumpkin and there's bats and I love it. So if you guys want to check that out, we'll link to that, um, to the Honey and Rue website in the show notes. So you can check it out. 
And as always, you can use code Henny and or <laughs> as always, you can use code Drink and Farm to get 10% off your first box if you want to get your October Honey and Rue box squared away. I mean, this flag is like worth the whole dang box and you know there's going to be more good stuff in there yeah I'm really excited about that flag because I actually do have a Halloween themed wreath for the chicken coop so now I'll have a Halloween flag so I'm one of those people I like I build up my decorations as time goes on I don't try to buy them all at once and Mm -hmm. it ends up being really fun because then every year I get a couple of new things so Yes. I buy a lot and get new stuff every year. I have a problem. (laughs) I mean, it's nice to decorate. You know who else is really good at decorating? I don't mean to like totally go off on a sidebar here, but, um, Katie Montgomery, Mm -hmm. our friend and teammate extraordinaire, she like decorates like no other. I, I just don't have it in me. I try really hard, (laughs) but I'm forgetful. (laughs) (laughs) It it does take a lot of effort. I would say Christmas around here got really intense last year. Halloween was a close second, but yeah. So we'll see how this year goes. All right. So we'll dive into this week's episode. Today, we're going to talk about power outages. Boo. Yeah, big boo. <laughs> During that storm today, my power flickered a couple of times and I was like, please Jesus, no. Like, because the reason we're gonna talk about this today is because I went without power for oh gosh, how many days was it? So it was Thursday at 3 a.m. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So four days. When it's a long power. time. Yes. The longest we've gone without here. Maybe the longest I've gone without ever in my whole 33 years. Um, And I think we handled it like a boss, (laughs) but it was a good way to show us like heaven forbid the power grid gets attacked or (laughs) there's some kind of natural disaster and your power is out for a long time and you're not going to have it. And you have freezers full of food. You have animals to take care of. What do you do? This is the kind of stuff you want to prepare for beforehand the best that you can. And then the first time it happens, you're going to identify where the gaps are and be able to course control. But there are some major things that you'll want to think about now, um, prepare for now, (laughs) think through now so that when, you know, it's 90 degrees in the middle of the summer and it's hot and you're cranky, you're not trying to think through this stuff for the first time. Yeah. Or ice season is coming yes. up. So lots of states end up with big, long power outages for ice season. So that's a bad time to not have power. Also, I, yes. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there's no convenient time to live with that no. power for multiple days. <laughs> yes. It is a pain in the ass and it makes you appreciate every time you go to flick on a light switch. Cause I think it took me three days to stop trying to flick a light switch on. Oh yeah. I bet. Cause like, yeah, it, it kind of reminds you of how many things you just do by habit, like mm-hmm. automatic habit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> take for granted. <laughs> like, holy crap. <laughs> All right. Oh. So this is just you know, like, we were saying a good thing to prepare for in general, even if you don't have a farm, even if you live in a city and you have chickens, Um, you need to think through your scenario, or if you live in the suburbs and maybe have a little bit going on, um, it doesn't really matter what stage of the farm hobby farm chicken keeper game you're in. Like, this is just important human stuff to think through too. Yeah. Cause, um, you don't realize how many things you use power for on your animals or for your plants until you don't have it anymore. Yes. (laughs) And I think there's some stigma around, um, thinking through these things or being kind of labeled a prepper because you might seem crazy or you're like a conspiracy theorist. No, like, obviously you can take anything to an extreme, yeah. right? Just like, you know, you can be a crazy, crazy chicken person, or you can just be like, I have two chickens, you know, anything can be an extreme. <laughs> um, so don't feel like, like, I think for me, even it took over, okay, you're not a prepper. 
Like you're not in a negative way. You're just thinking through what's going to be best for you and your farm and your family. Um, and every time you end up in one of these situations, like the toilet paper shortage, now I just buy two anytime I go <laughs> to the store and need to get it. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> it's not like we won't use it. So you can think through things like that, even outside of this. And it is okay. It doesn't make you a wackadoodle, at yeah. least in my book. <laughs> well, so here's something to keep in mind too. When you have the things that you need to feel like your basic needs are met, that frees up space in your brain to problem yes. solve, which not only helps you and your family, it can be helpful to your community as well. Mm-hmm. Should you be called on to help serve in whatever capacity you can in the event of a big, like a really big disaster mm-hmm. or a long-term power outage or anything like, like it, it makes sense to make sure that basic needs are met for at least, you know, a handful of days. <laughs> right. And we can take care of ourselves um, and prepare for ourselves. And that's important because you need to be able to prioritize your farm because mm-hmm. the farm can't take care of itself necessarily. No, those animals, the animals are not wild animals. <laughs> no, <laughs> they, you know, on our farms, they are pretty dang pampered. So oh they might gosh. notice if their barn fans are not working. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> All right. So first we're going to talk about general preparedness tips. There's a really great website from Almanac, really great article from almanac.com that summarized things really great. Um, had some good ideas and we'll just go through that. So obviously, um, tornadoes, hurricanes, severe thunderstorms, uh, flooding and extreme weather can knock out power in your home, but even an animal or too many AC units on a power grid can cause a power outage stuff happens. So deal first with the biggest safety issue. So bringing light to the dark, staying warm and dry, and providing food to yourself and your family. Those are your three human priorities to make sure you're good so you can take care of everything else on your farm. For sure. Uh, And some of the ways that you can have light in a power outage include like flashlights um, or battery powered LED lanterns are really useful to have. Um, and I have actually tested this tip that they gave in this article to attach a strip of the glow in the dark tape to your flashlights. Cause that mm-hmm. does make them easy to find in a power outage. The only thing is, is like, you can't store your flashlights in drawers or like things like that, <laughs> because then it never gets charged. <laughs> right. Right. Um, our camping flashlights have glow in the dark tape on them so that, you yes. know, they charge during the day while they're out. And then while we're camping, you know, like we're like where the kids take the flashlights and you can like see them on that picnic bench or over there in that pile of leaves. (laughs) Smart. So this is handy even for non-power outage issues, anywhere where you're going to be relying on flashlights. (laughs) Love that. And headlamps are also really useful. Every family member should have a headlamp. You should know where it's at, store it in a place where it's accessible, um, because that way you're not having to hold a flashlight while trying to do other things. You need a hand. You need both of your hands free. If you're mm-hmm. like holding a flashlight and trying to like do things with this hand, it's you're not going to be able to do everything that you need to do. Um, and you can strap a headlamp to a gallon of water. And it creates like a glowing lantern. So if you don't have a lantern on hand it, and it works, that's another thing that I've actually done like during power outages and during camping. So, um, we used to do like backpacking and a lot of more like extended camping type of off grid stuff. So Mm -hmm. we're pretty used to figuring out like how to get by short term (laughs) without power. (laughs) And those, um, those tips have been extremely useful. Great. I'm glad that you've tried those and they were good. (laughs) Bev approved. Bev approved. So, um, we didn't exactly follow this. Um, but the article recommends avoid using candles or an open flame as a light source, as it can be a fire hazard that can make your situation way worse. Um, especially if you have children or pets in the home, like stuff happens. Um, but if it's your like 
temporary solution while you're trying to like not bump around in the dark or find your flashlights. Totally fine. We just light candles anyways. Not like a lot of them, but like the Bath and Body Works three wick candles, like seasonal. Holla. <laughs> um, <laughs> we light those for funsies. So just make sure you have a secure candle holder and it's kind of away from the kiddos and the pets. If you're going to do that, just be really careful. Um, and if you're going to go that route, make sure you have lots of lighters and matches to light your candles. But again, flashlights are probably the good primary source. Candles would probably be a backup. I always like to light a candle and leave it in the bathrooms. That way people can find their way to those places. Cause those don't tend to have as many flammable things yeah. around, or at least mine don't. They're mostly tile and hard. Like my bathrooms yeah. are just not very cozy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can obviously, and this is the first thing I did, uh, use your cell phone light for as long as your battery lasts. Um, this can drastically, um, drain your battery if you're not careful, but what you can do, at least if you have an iPhone, I can't speak to other phones. You can change your battery life to, um, low battery or like a low setting. So it's not automatically refreshing your mail and apps in the background. That'll extend the life of your battery a lot. You can also have one of those portable USB battery packs on hand, keep that charged and handy. Um, and yeah, there's also like solar battery packs out there too. I haven't tried those, but I'm going to guess it's going to work pretty well because our lights on our porch are like those cute Edison bulb lights that are solar powered. And that was actually a great way to have outdoor lighting <laughs> during the power outage. Oh. And we just have those for fun. So I highly recommend doing something like that outside. If you live in the middle of nowhere and it just gets really dark at night, <laughs> you're going to need light outside. <laughs> yeah. Um, those solar, uh, battery power pack things they are, they're little USB chargers. They work great. Um, I have used those and I've used a couple of different kinds. I have some that have the solar panel like built right into the top. Mm -hmm. The older style had a plug-in solar panel that like went with it. It was like the soft solar oh, panel funny. that you like unfolded <laughs> the backpacking and the camping and all of that. Like we always, like we've had solar, battery chargers for yeah. years now. Cause we just, we didn't want to have to live without cell service in the case of an emergency. Like right. we didn't use our cell phones while we were out in the wilderness, but if we did end up having an emergency, it'd be good to keep that thing charged. So you could find mm -hmm. service to get help. So that was yes. our reasoning for it, but it turns out it's useful in the event that there's a power outage on your farm. <laughs> yes. Love that. <laughs> So uh, you also want to make sure that you stay warm in a power outage during the summer. That's not as much trouble. You really want to stay cool. Um, mm -hmm. But in the winter, uh, the cold can be deadly in the event of a power outage, depending on where you live. So try to pick a room uh, with few or no windows on the south side, um, because that will allow you to have maximum heat during the day. And, uh, if you layer up, that helps, uh, keep your warmth on you. So, you know, a handful of hoodies, a blanket or two, maybe some leggings, those will keep you good. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, if you do have rooms with windows, you can drape them with blankets or comforters or quilts. Cause that helps insulate, uh, the cold from getting in through those windows. Um, and you never want to uncover South facing windows during the day. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And you want to uncover those south facing windows during the day because you want to let the sun's warmth in. So there you have it. Yes. And just a reminder, never burn charcoal for heating or cooking indoors. Bad idea. Mm -hmm. Never use your oven as a source of heat either. Yeah. So um, and I think that this reminder. goes for propane, uh, like those camping stoves oh. and things like that. You don't yeah. want to use those inside the house either. Um, because yeah. they don't have the right vents and stuff on them to vent the carbon monoxide out. They're meant for outdoor yeah. cooking. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just err on the side of caution with anything like that. All right. So here's some ideas for cooking and eating without power and the other things that we just told you not to use indoors. <laughs> so, um, only open your refrigerator or freezer door when it's absolutely necessary. Um, so you can kind of plan ahead to minimize the time that that door is open. If the doors stay closed on a refrigerator without power, 
um, it'll keep your food safe for four hours. So that's not super long, but if it's just kind of a freak accident and the power company is going to turn your power on really quick, um, you might be okay. Uh, a full freezer will keep its temperature for 48 hours. If the freezer is half full, you got about 24 hours. All of our freezers are pretty full. Um, so when I was looking up online, how long my freezer was going to be okay for, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, cause I didn't think it would be able to go for that long, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, if it's cold outside, if it's winter and this is happening to you, you can store food outside. If the temperature is 40 degrees or less, um, you can monitor food temperature or outdoor temperature with a thermometer. If you're not super sure, you can also keep ice packs in your freezer for use in coolers or your refrigerator in case of an outage. And, you know, you can prioritize the way you're eating your food. <laughs> um, so say, you know, it's the middle of the day, your power goes out, maybe look at your refrigerator and say, okay, what's going to go bad if this doesn't get turned back on, get creative, cook that way. Um, but you can also eat things that are like canned food if you don't even want to mess with that. So vegetables, beans, soup, things like that. Um, if you have one, you can cook on a wood stove. I'm not sure a lot of people have those. I don't, but if weather is okay, or you can manage to hang out in the cold for a while, you can use an outdoor grill outdoors only. Yeah. <laughs> use yes. your outdoor grill outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have one quick tip and this is something you can do to be prepared for a power outage. Um, we reuse our gallon and half gallon milk and water jugs. We fill them with water and we put them in our freezers to take up all of the spare freezer space. Mm. Those jugs get used in the coolers whenever we need something, you know, to like take cold beers somewhere or transport cold eggs or, you know, cold meat or whatever somewhere. We use those for that. But in the event of a power outage, we could pull those frozen jugs out of the freezer and store them in the fridge to keep the fridge colder longer. So that could extend your fridge life. So, um, it, and it helps you save power throughout the year because when your freezer is stocked full with frozen jugs, it doesn't have to work as hard to maintain that frozen temperature. So ah. hit it from all the directions. Yes. <laughs> Love that. So what to do if you lose water, mm. this is like the worst part. Yeah. Um, Can I tell you something really quick? Absolutely. I didn't know that wells required electricity until I yes. lived in a place that had a well. So I didn't understand why people were freaking out about water and power outages. Cause like when you live in a place that has a water grid, the tap just always turns on. <laughs> I don't, it's yeah. like magic. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, we're on a well here too. So <laughs> it is just heartbreaking when you try to you do that habit thing of turning on the faucet and nothing happens <laughs> yeah and it's scary because water is required for like everything yes including coffee mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um if a hurricane's coming or a bad storm's coming and there's possibility of tornadoes or something that could knock out your power one of the things you can do is fill up your bathtub with water for washing and flushing, because that's the other thing. Can't really successfully flush your toilets multiple times if you're on a well, mm -hmm. which is just kind of gross after a while. Yeah. I mean, yellow, mellow, but you can yes. only do that for so long. <laughs> yes. Brown, down. Ugh, down immediately. <laughs> down immediately. <laughs> down with a brown. All right. If you expect the temperatures to drop below freezing in your house, you don't want to fill up your tub because what can end up happening is the water can freeze and crack your tub. And that would be really sad. And most of them are made out of and fiberglass. Yeah. yeah. So don't do that if it's really cold. Um, but what you can do in a cold climate is pack fresh snow in buckets and bring that indoors to melt. Um, also in the winter, you want to make sure you keep your pipes from freezing by turning on the slow trickle of water, but this only works if you aren't on a well. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, 
<laughs> protect your water pipes by ra- uh, freezing from freezing by wrapping them in layers of newspaper or plastic wrap. If you can't do that trickle trick. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, one thing that you can do when you know that inclement weather could come at any time uh, and affect the power grid is um, you can make sure that you keep your car's gas tank at least halfway full. Um, gas stations rely on electricity to power their pumps. So if it's a big power grid thing, you can't go refill your car. Um, so if you didn't know that, the more, you know, (laughs) don't find that one out the hard way. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and never drive across down to power lines outside like ever. So if you come across a road and you see power lines across it, don't drive across them. Don't assume the rubber and the tires are going to protect you. (laughs) <laughs> those no. power lines, um, depending on what kind they are, they could pack, like they pack a serious punch. Like I think they all pack some level of serious punch, but some of them are worse than others. Yeah. Don't do and that. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, another way that you can, um, protect your car is plan ahead and don't park your car under where there might be big trees just in case like big limbs come down or anything like that in the storm. Um, you may need to use your car at some point. So Mm -hmm. if possible, make sure that it's somewhere where it can be accessible and not destroyed by the storm. So they have access to it if needed. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this next one. When we talk about how Bev and I have prepared for, um, these kinds of outages, but generator tips, um, the best way to get through a power outage is to avoid it altogether. And this means investing in a home generator. You can save a lot because you can save a lot of time and stress during emergency outages um, because you can keep your heat going. You can keep your well going if you have the appropriate plugs um, and you can keep your lights on. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Um, But it's important to note never to run a gas generator inside a home or a garage or connect it to the home's electrical system because you don't want to die of carbon monoxide poisoning, which was something I was very paranoid about, even though ours was very far away from the house Um, (laughs) the whole time, just because my anxiety likes to play tricks on me. Yeah, that's fair. (laughs) Yes. Um, and there are solar portable generators available as well as options. Um, if you want to avoid a gas generator altogether, in fact, I just bought one as a present for my mom. It's really cool. It comes with like multiple solar panels and it, you can get ones that are so big, uh, that they run a microwave or, um, an instant pot. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. Um, and they're kind of cool. Cause like they're, they, they look kind of like a stereo. You pick them up with a handle. And so what, what you do is you take them outside to charge with their solar panels and then you pick up the little handheld generator and then bring it inside the house. So oh. if it's winter time, you can plug an electric blanket into it and it'll run it all night. You can plug your coffee maker into it in the morning. If it's a strong enough one, you can even plug your TV into it. It'll run a TV for like three hours. But I mean, if it's long-term storm time, like save the TV if you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they're pretty cool. Um, I forgot what the company name is, but I'll look it up and I'll add a link to it in the show notes in case anybody wants to check it out. All right. A few technology tips, um, because we all rely on technology these days. You want to keep your cell phone charged. Um, if the power is out, dim the brightness on your phone and turn off Wi-Fi to save your battery life. You can close all your apps too that are open and running in the background. I know I'm really bad about not doing that. <laughs> Just I had normally. 50 open the other day. <laughs> oh gosh, I probably have that right now too. Um, you can also get a surge protector to safeguard your electronics from harmful effects of power surges and voltage spikes. So that would be like a before the power outage thing you want to do. Um, a power surge is a spike in an electrical current flowing through the wires in your house. And this can damage common appliances, sensitive AV electronics and commuter equipment. So it's just a good thing to have. I fried a laptop by not having it plugged into a surge protector before. So now I, I, well, we have a whole house surge protector now 
Um, but before that, I only plugged my laptop into a surge protector after that. Cause you just never know. <laughs> so if you've had a power outage, what should you do after it? Um, well, the first thing is, is if you think that you've got some food that has gone bad, if in doubt, throw it out, but it's yes. not worth it. The last thing you want to do is be without electricity, without running water and have foodborne illness. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like compounding the issues. Um, perishable foods that have been exposed to temperatures above 40 degrees for more than two hours are no longer safe to eat. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and make sure that you've put out any candles or kerosene lamps that you use during the outage. Um, when you leave the room or you're going to be gone for an extended period of time, because these become a fire hazard, Uh, The fire department is busy during huge emergencies, so they don't need to come to your house because a kerosene lamp got knocked over and Mm -hmm. lit a room on fire. It'd be a bummer. Um, And also, uh, you know, take some time to do a little bit of digging. You can Google some things, um, you know, check out some people on YouTube or Instagram that talk about storm preparedness. Uh, You can learn what you should keep in your emergency survival kit for home and for your car. Uh, Some of that is going to depend on your priorities, your region, um, and the types of storms and stuff that you're preparing for. So a lot of that is really kind of custom information. So that's why we didn't dive into it on this episode. Yeah. Um, and you should also learn how to be prepared for health emergencies. Um, so learn what's put in a first aid kit, learn how to use a first aid kit, learn some basic first aid. Um, those are really good skills that will serve you at the most surprising of times. Um, I always stay up to date on my CPR certification and my first aid certification, and I'm not as good at keeping up on this one, but I do prefer to stay wilderness first aid certified as well. Um, because being in a rural area, um, there's not always emergency services close by. So it makes sense to have just a little bit, um, extra knowledge in those Mm -hmm. emergencies. So, um, plan ahead accordingly. Yes. And I just bought a huge, first case kit from Amazon. We can link to that in the show notes too. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing, if you have a health savings account and you go on Amazon, just look for the little thing that says FSA or HSA eligible, because you can use that money to pay for some of this stuff. So especially like the health related stuff. Um, and now because of the pandemic, Certain over-the-counter medications are also covered under that as well. Um, so it used to be a little dicey using your HSA or FSA dollars for this kind of thing, but now it's like crystal clear. You're good to go. So if you have that, use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and if you aren't sure what exactly that means, it's um, it's basically tax-free dollars that you can spend mm-hmm. on health stuff. Um, your employer takes the money out of your bank account puts it onto this HSA or FSA card, depending on what kind it is. And then you spend it accordingly. Um, and then if they ask, you just prove that you spent it accordingly to save your receipts. Um, but it's an excellent way, uh, to stock up on those kinds of things and save a few dollars for sure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what did you learn during your extended power outage? Cause I have a confession. I don't think I've ever lived somewhere for four days without electricity. I mean, unless it was intentional, <laughs> like going into the woods. <laughs> yeah. That's a little different when it's by choice, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so I learned that we were pretty prepared. Um, but because we had never been in that situation before, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, we have a generator Um, it's a gas generator. It's pretty big size. There are a couple plugs on it. Um, and it does have a, I think it's 240 volt plug on it as well, which means as long as you have the appropriate cord, you can plug that bitch into your well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Handy. Handy. When we (laughs) figured that out, I almost cried tears of joy. Um, we went a couple hours before we figured it out, but I'm just glad it wasn't more than that. (laughs) But prior to that, my husband works for a 
water treatment um, company. So they sell like filters and water softeners and all that fun stuff. So he actually drove to work and got like the big jugs of water. And then he realized we can probably just plug this right in. (laughs) Um, But it didn't hurt because with a portable generator, it keeps your fridge and freezer going. You can hook up small appliances um, for cooking, like our air fryer and our George Horman. Those were the two things that we used a lot um, during that time. Uh, And we figured out how to um, rotate things too, because you can tap out your generator. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's kind of just like, um, kind of like a little game of, okay, we have this plugged in and this plugged in, and then now we're done using these things. So we can watch TV now and yeah. just keep it, keep it running <laughs> because we have to keep it on to keep the freezer and fridge going, but generators need a break. Um, so we would shut it off like while we were outside doing chores and things like that, um, just to give it a little breather, but we were going through probably like $25 worth of gas a day. <laughs> Oh yeah. That's kind of a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, gas prices have been increasing a little bit, so that's kind of just where we're at right now. So depending on when you're listening to this, it could be better. It could be worse. Who knows, (laughs) but keep that in mind too, that maybe it's not a bad idea to have some kind of savings account for these kinds of emergencies. So you're not scrambling to figure out how you're going to pull some money together to keep your generator going. So you don't lose freezers or fridges full of food. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause one of the things I learned is that, um, during like major catastrophes like that, you can actually claim all the food that you lost in your fridge. Mm. Um, but that only works if you had like significant damage to your house also, because you have to pay your deductible. So oh. if you have a thousand dollar house deductible, and you had, you know, like a whole cow in your freezer, like it almost evens out. So it's not worth it to claim it if that's the only yeah. thing that was lost or damaged. So yeah. Yeah. And our power company, um, their policy was if it's it cl- declared an emergency, if you're without power for five full days, they will give you a $25 credit. That's it. Yeah. And guess what? We were just shy. Oh, for like of course. 12 hours. Oh yeah. Cause think of how many subscribers that is. They would have had oh, to pay out. There were yeah. over 800,000 people without power in Michigan. Like the guys yeah. that were here fixing our transformer. Cause what happened was it was raining like crazy and there was a lot of lightning and the lightning found our transformer <sighs> and blew the top right off of it. You want to talk about waking up? Oh yeah. You're shitless. Like, yeah. I was just, Oh, it I bet it sounded like, like a bomb two went hours. off. It did. But luckily I, I I've heard that sound before. So I knew it wasn't a bomb, but it like two hours, I was like nauseous. Cause it scared me so bad, <sighs> but yeah. So we got lucky there. And I think we were like the only ones on our road that didn't have power because of that too. So it was a treat and we were not prioritized very highly because there weren't a ton of people in our area suffering. Oh, ouchie. Yes. Yeah. That's no good. So, um, what were some of the things, um, that you found that you had on hand or that you really wanted during the power outage, like when, when that happened? Um, one other thing before I forget to, um, and then I'll get into that. Uh, we bought our, um, generator from somebody that fixes generators. So it was new to us, but not brand new. Um, we maybe paid like $300 for it. Oh. So guys check the marketplace, check, check other places. If you can't afford a brand new one, um, that is an option. Yeah. Uh, and figure out how to use it before you're <laughs> in that situation, because, um, it wasn't turning on and we couldn't figure it out. And it was something stupid, oh. <laughs> but Matt eventually figured it out. Uh, cause he's awesome. But I was a little worried there that we had bought this thing. It sat for like a year and never used it. And now it's just not working, but no, just make sure you know how to use it before you're in that situation. Yeah, no, um, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah. Do like a power outage drill, you know, like how schools yeah. do like fire drills and like tornado drills, like do a power outage drill at your house, yes. plug your generator in, make sure it works. Yes. Um, 
when you're doing those drills, the things you want to also know <laughs> that you have on hand, um, extension cords. Oh my gosh. Extension cords, um, stock up on super long ones because you don't want your generator right next to your house. Um, get the ones that have multiple plugs on them too, because one cord can go a long way, but if it's just got one plug on it, that's going to be super disappointing. Mm-hmm. So get one when that has a couple, I mean, you can plug a couple of things in there at the same time. Um, water is the number one thing for your farm animals, probably. Um, at least it is for ours, being able to plug into the well was super important. If you can't do that, um, or it's smart to have a backup plan. If your generator does fail, um, you want to come up with a plan. So our neighbor actually offered to haul water to us. So oh, that would have been good. Have a good relationship with at least one of your farm friends nearby. <laughs> yeah. That, that has a water, one of those water jug things that goes in the yes. back of a truck. I forget what those are called yes. like a water tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so making other farm friends and thinking through this scenario is very important. Um, we also use these dollar solar lights as little torches. Uh, <laughs> you can get them from like Walmart. Um, and then obviously like anything solar, you just set it outside during the day. Um, uh, we would keep them in the bathroom. Um, I would walk around with them before we figured out that we could plug a little lamp in and, and not kill our generator. Um, so that's an option. Um, if you have the space and it really doesn't hurt to buy bulk water or easy non-per- um, non-perishable food options, that's mostly for you and your family. Um, if I can afford it, like I said, I buy two things when I'm at the store. So like Clorox wipes, toilet paper, paper towel, bottled water. If I'm buying one, I just go ahead and buy two. I don't buy those things every single time I go shopping, but just simple things like that, that aren't going to bust your budget. You don't have to think, oh my God, I have to prepare for everything right this second. Um, you can do these things slowly over time, not break the bank. Yeah. You also can prepare for just, a like a week or two. Yes. Don't like, think about it as like the, like the zombie apocalypse has happened and you have to be like self-sufficient for the end of time. <laughs> you might Cause... have to be, but you can work small. small yeah. Goals. Work small. Well, cause like what'll <laughs> happen though, is like, you'll end up with a lot of food yes. that'll go bad. Cause it's not mm-hmm. it's, like, usually that kind of food isn't your favorite food to eat. So you won't necessarily right. cycle it into your regular eating. And then like, you've got a whole basement full of expired canned goods and things like yes. that. And, or, you know, like, or you end up with a mouse infestation in your basement and like all the toilet paper gets chewed through in just <laughs> one winter, you know, like stuff like that just like happens. So yes. So that's why I always say like, you know, a couple of weeks is good enough because then you can recalibrate right, and figure out from there. <laughs> yes. yes. All right. Um, another really important takeaway from this whole experience was that it kind of made me think about solar power, power on the farm for certain things like the barn and the coops, maybe even the garage. Yeah. Um, luckily, our fence charger is electric. Uh, we have a smaller pasture area and that saved our butts. I was talking to somebody else nearby that is also a farmer and her charger is electric. So she was super worried that her cows would figure it out. Oh, so yours is solar. Mine is solar. Okay. Yours is solar. So yours worked throughout the power outage. Yes. Smart. All of mine are solar also. I don't have to use mine right now, but yeah. Now electric ones pack more of a pop. So that's why a lot of farmers prefer to have the electric ones, but having maybe even like one pasture as solar or a backup situation that, you know, you can pivot to if you need to something to think about. If you have larger animals that like to test the fences. Yeah. Um, that usually, was the last thing you needed at that time. Yeah. <laughs> usually, um, once they know that that little wire or wires are angry. They're not going to test them, but there are some animals out there that just really like to test the limits. I mean, they got attitude. Yeah. Yeah. But so that having that and having those solar lights outside made me think, okay, you don't necessarily move over to solar power because it's going to save you money. It's going to take years and years and years before it actually saves you money. But in these kinds of situations and wanting to be energy dependent, 
and kind of feeling like the power told me to the power company told me to, that I could go F myself with a $25 credit. If I suffered for five days, kind of makes you want to think about being a little more energy independent, depending on how you do your solar setup, you're still going to have to deal with a power company. Mm-hmm. Um, because more than likely you're going to still have to pay your bill and then they're going to pay you back, which is just bonkers in my brain. <laughs> um, but as I look into it more, it's just kind of interesting how that works, but doing that, like on the chicken coop that has no power right now or doing it, you know, on my garage or my barn. So I can see what I'm doing in those places and not have to worry about a headlamp. Um, that would be pretty cool and probably wouldn't take very much, honestly, because it's just a few things in those, in those locations. So that's something I'm going to look into, um, probably a few years out, <laughs> but, um, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Um, cause you wouldn't need nearly as many, um, solar panels. So if you just threw right. like, you know, a handful of solar panels on the top of the barn and then had a, a battery like station that just, you know, like mm-hmm. had enough to run like five plugs and the lights like yeah yeah I mean that that isn't big at all so mm-hmm. yeah that, that feels totally doable and then you can kind of dip your toe into it and see how it works <laughs> yeah yeah we've kind of talked about maybe doing a little bit at a time and just kind of building up you with any of this stuff you don't have to go big or go home yeah no. unless you want to and have the budget <laughs> I don't have the budget. I might have the desire. I don't have the budget. (laughs) Um, The last thing is installing a generator transfer. um, So we don't have to run extension cords through the house through cracked windows because Mm -hmm. the cracked window thing kind of freaked me out because one, I'm really scared of bats. Oh yeah. Get into your house. I Mm -hmm. I have a lot of trauma around that from a childhood, but I won't get into that today. Um, (laughs) two, you don't want bugs in your house. Um, what we did was we put towels over that too. And three, I was super paranoid again about carbon monoxide poisoning. That's the other thing. Um, battery operated carbon monoxide and fire alarms, super Mm. smart for this situation. Yep. I have Um, those. (laughs) Yes. And so I bought one, And then I had one that plugs into the wall for carbon monoxide. So I just used one of my plugs for that for peace of mind. Yeah. Um, But with the generator transfer is basically like a plug that goes in. I'm probably going to explain this wrong, but it plugs into your panel, your electrical panel, and then you get to choose what's on and what's off. Yeah. The power company has to install them. Yeah. 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 So basically what it does is you plug your generator into your house Mm -hmm. And then you pick and choose based on what you flip on the panel, what Mm -hmm. can be running and what can't be. Yeah. Yeah. That way you don't have to mess around with the extension cords or the Mm -hmm. plugging things into extension cords. Your house kind of runs as if you have power, but just like at a very reduced level. (laughs) Yeah. So we might do that because, um, based on some of my research, it just sounds like it's only a couple hundred dollars to have somebody come do that. So it's something we're going to definitely look into and prioritize. Whew. So that was a lot, <laughs> but it was good though. I think it's handy stuff. Like everybody ends up with power fears at some yeah. point. Um, and hopefully this can help reduce some anxiety and make you feel more prepared for mm-hmm. those moments. Cause you know what to do. Um, and you can always bookmark this episode and come back to it later in the event that you have a power outage, you should have a little bit of time on your hands and you can listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> So Bev, what do you have ready for this kind of situation? And what do you think your biggest impact to your farm would be? So uh, I have a full house generator. Um, We had that installed when we moved in because we were, we had like super job anxiety and we were moving (laughs) from the city to a rural area. And we were worried that if we had an extended power outage, that we could both lose our jobs, which Mm -hmm. would in fact, prevent us from being able to maintain this farm anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first investments we made with the money that we made off of our house when we sold it. Um, So it was installed by the time we moved in or shortly thereafter. So we've never lived here without a generator. Um, So anytime the power goes out, the generator just automatically turns on and the house runs as normal. Um, Mm -hmm. and the generator is hooked up to its own dedicated 500 gallon propane tank. 
And, um, one thing I need to do is I need to buy that propane tank because we've actually had it for five years now and we've never had an extended power outage. (laughs) So the propane tank has never had to be refilled. So we have to pay to maintain it every year because they're not coming out and filling it on a regular basis. So that's on my list to check off just to like gain a little bit of financial independence from that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not expensive. It's like a hundred bucks a year or something like that, but still it's, it's basically it's flushing it down the toilet. Yeah. 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 Um, and to maintain the whole house generator, it costs about 200 or $250 a year. They come and change like the oil on it. Cause it's, it, it's like an engine. It turns over like a car engine when the oh. power goes out and you can hear it. So that's how we know for sure the power went out. Cause we can hear the generator outside the house mm-hmm. running. Um, and it runs off of that, um, it runs off of that propane and I forget how many days we have, but I'm pretty sure we have 10 to 14 days if we ran the house as normal and Uh. it has enough punch that we can use. Basically they said that we could be making Thanksgiving dinner and doing laundry at the same time. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, we have two ovens. So like, so we can run both ovens at the same time still, but they still said like, don't run everything, but in the event of a power outage, like obviously you would be wise and turn off anything that you didn't need. Don't do anything Mm -hmm. that you don't need to do because that helps conserve that, um, that propane to have in the event that it is an extended uh, power outage. Because actually the thing that made us know or made us feel like we needed that was there was a 10 day power outage here. Um, a few years before we moved in, there was an ice storm and it took out the power grid. Uh, and it was 10 days without power here at this house. (laughs) And we were like, we can't live without power for 10 days. That's a long time. Yeah. We're like, we just sold this house. We have this money. Let's invest it in this so that we know Mm -hmm. that we never have to experience that. Right. And so it's a lot of peace of mind. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, and the, uh, another reason why we did it. And actually the reason why I would do it again, even without all the job anxiety, cause I don't have job anxiety anymore. Like we've lived here long enough. If we lost our jobs, we would find new ones or we're creative people. We'd figure something else out to do, right. um, is the water situation. We have three full size troughs outside that mm-hmm. have to stay full. And I refill them every other day. That's how much water those animals drink. And the idea of trying to haul that water or buy it in one gallon, like, and the ducks (laughs) waste the water. They're so they're jerks about it. They're pooping in it. (laughs) They're pooping in it. And I can't imagine having to buy all that and just have the Mm -hmm. ducks poop in it. That make me so mad. Um, so having power at the house is really so that I don't have animals dying of thirst. Um, but We've been using um, rain barrels and we've been slowly hooking those up. And that is my long-term goal is to have a rain barrel for every trough eventually. So then that takes that anxiety away also. So that's something else that you can do to prepare for a storm, not a winter storm, because you can't keep the rain barrels during the the winter time, but a summer storm that Mm -hmm. knocks the power grid out that can help save you from having water shortage anxiety for your animals. So yeah. And we feel kind of bougie up here with our full house generator. Well, <laughs> the anxiety is through the roof. <laughs> I think it is bougie. However, I think that's a really good way for people to think about how they want to prioritize their resources. Um, if you're considering being a little more energy independent or with the solar panels, if you're considering um, this kind of disaster idea, um, what are you willing to give up in the short term or even kind of long term in order to have that comfort if something bad happens? And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say if you have a full house generator and then one day you sell your house, like that's gonna be really appealing <laughs> to a home buyer to not have to worry about that themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, especially if it's other people from the city who just have never had yeah. to deal with something like that. So something too, like the first time you go through something, it's always the worst. Yeah. Um, and then after that you survive it and you're like, Oh, well, like if nothing catastrophic happened, you're like, well, nothing catastrophic happened. So if it ever happens again, I know what to do to go through it. And these are the things that are going to make it better next time or more manageable yes. next time. And I won't lie. Like we, our power went out at like two or three in the morning. We didn't get an update until almost nine o'clock at night. 
Um, and they said on it, like, you're not going to have power until Monday, which would have been five days. Um, and that was Thursday night that we got that. And I cried. I was Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I can do this for this many days, but that's before we understood too, that our hot water heater still worked. Yeah. Cause you have it on propane, right? (laughs) We didn't figure that one out for three days. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, that getting that information. And then I had to go take a really cold shower because I thought I had to take a cold shower. Yeah. No, I feel like Uh, such a dumb ass, but that's the other thing too. Like you just learn these things. But now that we've been through that experience after I got through like the first 24 hours, honestly, it was fine. The most annoying part was how loud the freaking generator is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you don't know what you don't know. Like that's just, that. that's just the truth of it. There's no like there's no feeling silly about that. That's this information right. that you never needed. Yeah. <laughs> until Matt this was moment. like super disappointed in himself for not knowing that. But I had asked him because <laughs> he's like, there should still be enough hot water in the tank if you want to go take a bath. Because bubble baths are my thing. Yeah, so I was like, mine too. Well, are you gonna have to like relight the pilot light on the on the tank? And then I was standing out near where where the hot water tank is, and I heard it kick on, and I'm like oh my gosh, that thing's still going. <laughs> and that's how we figured out that we still had hot water. So and I, I hope you immediately gave yourself that bubble bath. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Not immediately, but a couple hours later. Yes. Cause chores had to be done. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> Self-care during power outage. Super important. It is. It's important. <laughs> All right. So now it's time for, we can't even corner. Yay. Yay. So Bev, what can't you even about this week? All right. I can't even that we bred our first goats on our farm. Yay! It took that like be a good feeling. Oh, it was amazing because it took like 30 minutes, like, which is longer than it will in the future. They're, they're, they're baby bucks. So they don't know what they're doing yet. <laughs> so how did you, um, have them do it? So, um, because Aurora was in 4-H, she got the right face halters for the goats. Uh So I haltered a doe and I took her outside the fence line and I, um, tied her to the gate and then I haltered a buck, took him out there. And then I, I kept him on a loose cause I didn't want them wrapping on each other. because that's what they would do. I kept him loose and let him kind of do his thing. And I read her body language to decide if it was actually time. Um, I did have a doe that I tried to pair that it wasn't time. And I, I didn't torture her for five right. minutes. You could tell I put her away, put, and then, um, pulled someone else out to see if they were ready. Um, and that worked out really well. Uh, and I'm just, it, it just felt really good to not have to go through so much work and stress and time yes. and energy. And like, I just, I invested a lot last fall to not end up with any, baby Mm -hmm. goats in the spring. It was really kind of like defeating. So now like I've, I, I I had an original plan. I decided though, that I'm going to be a little more conservative about it though. And I'm going to breed more does sooner. That way, if someone loses, I can rebreed in time to have all my kids on the ground by April. Um, because I realized I can, I can figure out how to fit more does in the barn, <laughs> but I can't figure out how to make a doe have kids in April when it's February <laughs> and she's not pregnant. <laughs> like right. that's not possible. Right. Um, so I, so I made a little change to my plan and did that. So, um, I'll put a link in the show notes to the, um, I did an IGTV about the first pairing and then I started posting stories, um, of the future pairings and I saved it as a highlight on my Instagram profile. So you can go check that out. Uh, my stepmom sent me a message though. And she's like, is that goat porn? I just watched. (laughs) And I was like, no, I swear I didn't like film them actually doing the deed. I just, I filmed, I wanted to show people though, what it looked like when a doe was ready. Because that was one of the hardest things for me to learn. She stands, she wags her tail, she backs up to him and she isn't bothered by him whatsoever. Like when you get those body language things, like, and you know, you say that and you're like, well, what does my doe look like when she's like that? Well, you can see that in that video because he is like little guy. He's like jumping up on her and like kind of humping at her, but he's not, he's not really doing the deed. Um, Not yet anyways. Uh, And like, and she's just like, Okay. 
<laughs> I saw she does. Consent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can tell when they're not ready. <laughs> yeah, for you that are listening and not watching, I just like stared off into space and did nothing <laughs> for like four <laughs> seconds. That's, that's what she did. So yeah, so I thought that that could be useful for people wanting to breed goats, but weren't mm-hmm. like weren't sure what all the descriptions meant. So you get to see all the different. You get to see it when they're not ready. You get to see it when they're ready. To see it when it's borderline. You see what my future pairings look like. It'll be fun. <laughs> I love it. What a journey. <laughs> so what is your can't even this week? So mine is a video that surfaced on the interwebs. Um, somebody posted it to Twitter, but it's been shared in a few different places now. Um, you know, college football is back. Mm-hmm. Hooray. NFL is back. Hooray. Um, but during a college football game, it was at Miami University in Florida. Um, during a game, a cat was dangling. I saw that. Yes. A cat was dangling from like this little banner thing on top of like a one of the bowl sections, the upper bowl sections. And these people underneath that bowl section grabbed an American flag as like a little... Uh, trampoline like a net something yes like a (laughs) net there we go to break the fall of the cat and you see this cat just like struggling to either get back up or and then it just makes the decision to fall and the american flag breaks the fall um the cat kind of bounces off of it a little bit and then somebody picks up the cat simba style and holds it over their head and the crowd goes wild but the cat is clearly like pissed off, like, get off me. Let me get out of here. <laughs> it's like clawing people, but it's just nice to see people unite over something. But I have <laughs> so many questions. Like, how did the cat get in there? How did it, <laughs> why, why was it dangling like that? Where did the cat go afterwards? <laughs> like so many questions, but it's, it's quite the video. So check that out. It'll be in the show notes. It's a little traumatizing, but you know what? USA. USA. It has a happy ending. So like what more could you ask for? I know. <laughs> oh, people being united is what I need right now. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. We can reunite around cat surviving fall yes. at college football stadium and on an Britney American flag. <laughs> and Britney Spears. Come on, yes. Brittany. I saw she got engaged today. Yes. You tagged me on that. I was like, yeah. Yes, Brittany, live your life. Maybe she should adopt this cat. Oh, that feels appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, send us your can't evens in the Facebook group or via Facebook Messenger, Instagram, or email. You can send those drinkitfarm at gmail.com. We like to read those during our mini sodes um, to share with you all. So thank you for sending us those. Yeah. And be sure and leave us a review. We read one review a week here on the podcast. We don't have a new one to read this week, Mm -hmm. Um, but all of the ones that we read, uh, you go into a little drawing, we pick a winner, you win an exclusive coffee mug that is not and has never been in the shop. And it's super cute. We get the greatest feedback on it. And in fact, those of you that have gotten the mug, I have an ask for you. Will you please take a picture of you drinking and farming with it? and tag us on Instagram. We will find it. We will share it. And then other people can see this awesome mug. Um, and then if you want the mug, you can leave us a review and you'll get entered in to win it. So yeah, I don't even have this mug. I don't have this mug either. Um, we're going to do a big, like fall restock, uh, in the shop sometime mm-hmm. soon. So when we do that, we'll order some extra stuff for ourselves and look at that mug. Yeah. <laughs> I need more mugs. <laughs> yes. My husband would disagree with me, but I always yeah. need more mugs. And my husband disagrees with me too, but I mean, Meh. Meh. I have like there are worse 70 things. mugs. It could yes. be drugs. Look. Yes. <laughs> Instead it's mugs and chickens. Yes. <laughs> All right. So just a reminder, we do have a series over on Patreon called straight no chaser. This is available to our patrons at the $5 level or above. You can go to patreon.com slash drink and farm for more information. You have to be at the $5 level, which means you're going to get something different from us. Um, 
or something else from us other than this podcast or YouTube video, it's a great way to support the podcast because this isn't free to do. Yeah. We'll just be honest. And I mean, you get more content, like more podcast content, super cool and super useful. So you'll like it. Trust me. And be sure and hit the subscribe button uh, and download the episode when you listen, if you're listening to this on a podcast player um, or follow button. I don't know what all the buttons are. Smash all the buttons. Just like take your phone and just be like, I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Because when you do those things, it helps more people like you find the podcast. Yes. And while you're listening, share that you're listening to us over in your Instagram stories and tag at drink and farm. When you do this, we will send you a promo code just for that episode. That'll give you a percentage off in the shop. You want that? Cause we're going to do that restock that Bev was just talking about. So yeah, do it please. And make sure you take a look at the show notes. You'll find links to the article we discussed today and anything else that we mentioned as extras um, while we were recording. And there will be a link to an anonymous survey to tell us how we're doing, links to our social media stuff and our merch shop. So that's it. So until next time, drink, farm, and and give give zero zero (laughs) clucks. Bye guys. Bye. We drink things, we farm things, we drink and farm things.